Part twelve of Collected Prose by James Elroy Flecker. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter three of the Grecians Physical Training. Harold Smith met the two schoolmasters, as arranged, comparatively early the next morning at a cafe. He found them ruefully consuming thin coffee and thick rolls, and pining for the flesh pots and teapots of England. He laughed at their dejected countenances, and gleefully produced from his pocket a fine pot of jam, which he good naturedly shared with the forlorn travellers. The little party became most amicable and as it was a fine, fresh morning, they resolved to make an expedition into the country. Their plans grew gradually more extensive and ambitious, till finally they decided to quit Bologna with no baggage but knapsacks, and to return thither only after some days of pedestrian exploration beyond the Apennines. They therefore took the train for a few miles so as to get on the foot of the mountains, alighted at an insignificant station on the line to Florence, and walked along the pass as far as the Bagni del Poretta, where they took rooms for the night and dined handsomely. Over coffee and cigars, Hoffman became expansive, and glowed as ruddy as his beard with delight. "'What a day! What a walk!' he cried. "'I feel quite young again. Smith, you're making new men of us poor schoolmasters. I wish you didn't walk at such a pace, though.' I should never have thought you were such an athlete, to look at you. It has been a fine excursion indeed. <laughs> enough exercise to make us comfortably tired, not enough to exhaust or take away the appetite. I'm feeling wide awake. If you people are willing, let's go on talking about education. I should love to, if it doesn't bore Smith for I want to hear more wisdom from the mouth of that wise young man. It strikes me as odd, you know, Edwinson, that at school we never said a word, either to each other or to anyone else, about the general principles and aims of education. We used, of course, to get quite excited about new or peculiar methods of pumping in knowledge, but we never really considered where, well, where... Where you were going to drive to when you'd got the tyres tight, if I may adopt your own cheery metaphorical style, Hoffman. And whither shall we drive to-night, O charioteer? Straight on. In the distance our road may be obscure, but we shall have no immediate difficulty in finding our way, for we are at least certain of tonight's destination. Physical training we must discuss. And here all sane men are with us in our efforts to discover how to preserve, maintain, and encourage health in our pupils. However, since we are not doctors, we must, I fear, confine ourselves to generalities. Now health, I think, should be as they say, not merely a harmony after the platonic style, but positive and exuberant. <sighs> Won't that tend to some rather depressing forms of heartiness? I don't like people who slap one on the back and poke one in the ribs. I don't much mind the type, especially among boys. It only means that the intellect of your hearty man is not as well trained as his body, or that the aggressor has not enough natural outlet for the exercise of his vivid animal strength. Or it may be that he has not learnt manners, and the hearty only offend those who are feeling weak and depressed. In this mountain air, my dear Edwinson, you are getting quite hearty yourself. And I confidently expect to see you playing leapfrog with Hoffman tomorrow, all the way down to Pistoia. All schools should be on heights. It is curious that altitude should not only invigorate the body, but elevate the mind. Height is not very necessary, Hoffman, and has become a mania with some people, who seem to imagine that the Spartans exposed their babies on the peak of Tigetus in order to improve their health. Pure air is what a school needs. But this pure air is of little use unless we breathe it all night long. All our boys will sleep in the open air, with just enough shelter to protect them from rain. Coals will be a thing of the past. The general health of the school will improve beyond belief, and not a school in England has the courage to do it. 
let us now build our beautiful school on the hills of imagination and let us build it on the south coast of england for i have a great faith in sunshine and sea down in hampshire there is a little village beside a great warm bay which i loved best of all places when i was a boy eastward a long wonderful spit of hard and shell-strewn sand divides the bay from the all but lake of a harbour westward rise white cliffs through which the tunnelling agents of the world have delved unknown and secret caves or carved striding hollow rocks such as turner drew in his polyphemus islanded out to sea on land you have a little level strip near the sea for playing fields and a little shaven down on which to build the school in all its pride and near by are moors yellow in spring and red in autumn to keep our fancies young i know your unnamed bay and its gentle scenery let us build there the school of our dreams and one day perhaps we will build on that shaven down a school in substance and reality for dreams have been realised before now my friend even schoolmasters dreams or have you never heard of la giocosa and the fair name of that great humanist vittorino da feltre and how he taught his mantuans the rhythm of body and mind and was loved by them as few schoolmasters have been loved before or since those bright renaissance days yet even in our imaginations and schemes let us be honourably fearless bold and practical and imagine not like the bad poet a golden and misty dream but like the good poet a strong and stirring reality and since we must construct the shape before we infuse the spirit let us first consider our portals and windows in what style shall our architect build shall he build in splendid gothic to match our old schools and cathedrals of england i hope not revived gothic has produced no single good building in england nor an ill-lighted vault suitable for a school we will have nothing to do with renewals of old styles we will not build after the greek fashion or the greek or roman or the full roman or byzantine or the moorish or the perpendicular or the jacobean or the gothic or the ruskin gothic our style must be as new as our school we will not oblige ourselves to build in stone because stone is symbolic nor in brick because brick is so lowly and hebraic we shall build for comfort and utility and obtain our beauty not from the added ornamentation of the antique style but from the principles of symmetry and design indeed i imagine we shall build our school after the american manner with iron and reinforced concrete of all methods of construction this is the strongest for the san francisco earthquake itself could not shake down the tallest and slimmest buildings wrought of this material therefore we shall build our school with straight and simple harmonious lines and in so doing we may perhaps be advancing into a new architectural style some day to be reckoned great and in its turn worthy of imitation i feel it would be very horrible to copy anything american and the idea of this shed arrangement of yours chills me won't it look rather like a powder magazine with its great bare white walls who said we were going to have bare white walls the delight and joy of my building will be in fresco and statuary not in pointed windows mullions and leaded panes on the outside the school shall be a blaze of colours and if frescoes fade even in the south of england so much the better for the artists of future generations who will have to come and paint as new ones why we will get the greatest pointillist artist alive to do our frescoes for those sunlight effects of his that can never be seen at a proper distance in galleries will be grand in the open air but it would be out of place to consider these details now we must attack the problem of health and waving romance consider our building from the sanitary point of view that simplicity of construction which we have chosen will surely go far to solve the problems of hygiene easy ventilation no corners for dirt central heating mechanical dust extraction desks arranged so that the light comes over the boy's left shoulders electric lights with shaded globes no carpets mouldings fire grates but a few easily beaten mats and running water in every bedroom these things will be obvious necessities to so modern an architect as ours 
and we need say no more about them we must have also a sanatorium under the direct management of a resident doctor strange it is though that any school which has the impertinence to ask over a hundred pounds a year for training and keeping boys as boarders should be destitute of these advantages but we have not yet entered directly into the subject of physical training is there really any necessity to do so i should have thought that we overdo it if anything in our english schools our system of games and considering all things what a splendid system it is is quite unique do not laugh at me hoffman i mean something more than a platitude nowhere abroad unless we count america can it be paralleled on the whole it makes for the happiness of boys compare the merry and confident aspect of our english youth with the miserable pinched prematurely earnest appearance of continental children think of the lives of german schoolboys embittered by the deadly gymnastics the huge classes the incessant cram the perpetual and ruinous horror of the final examination think of the ghastly statistics of child suicide in prussia is it not this appalling system that is making the modern german so different a man from the old is making him the great brutalizing force of the world how glorious is england in comparison perhaps indeed our discussion is futile did all public schools give such a mental education as the most intelligent boys receive at winchester and eton it would seem rash and utopian to expect still finer things of english education for the physical part of it is so invariably excellent but still if there be little room for improvement so much the easier to fill up the space and after all our system of games and sports has become very perverted my great objection is that we have so little variety in our games cricket for instance is usually the sole diversion of a boy's summer term except in the case of the three or four schools which practise rowing there is no better game we have heard this perhaps a little too often for encouraging adroitness of hand and quickness of eye but it is of no more use in the formation of bodily vigour and beauty than any other outdoor not sedentary occupation now cricket is a pastime which only the proficient can possibly enjoy that is to say it is a game fit for about half the school what happens to the other boys in the long summer afternoons are they allowed to take such exercises as they please to walk bicycle or play tennis very rarely is there any school in britain where boys are taught those two superb manly and most british exercises the riding of a horse and the sailing of a ship is then the only reasonable alternative enforced are the boys who dislike cricket and incompetent at it taught the game with special care and helped to take their part by diligent individual instruction like boys who are backward in their work no not anywhere in the kingdom what happens in most large schools is that there are special games made up of athletic dullards who are set three times a week or more to play out amongst each other the weariest the most melancholy of farces captained by some unathletic ineffectual classical scholar for five hours the diverting sport continues interrupted by a roll-call which ensures that no reprobate shall have shirked this noble duty for a little aimless wandering among woods and hills only too well do these incompetent and despicable boys none of them i am sure of the stuff which has made england what she is no the emptiness of waiting the interminable dullness of fielding the too brief joy of batting thus trained to perceive the inner charm of cricket what a welcome change what an instructive education to spend from time to time a whole sunbright afternoon watching by compulsion school matches the trouble in england is that we have never taken games seriously enough we look upon them as a spectacle or show on a level with the music hall and the variety entertainment how else could we endure the existence of professionals in true sport no professionalism could ever be admitted but as the thing is a show why the professionals make it a better show let us have professionals in order to instruct our boys and to roll the pitch for what other reason an intelligent english sportsman should desire their existence i cannot tell if we really consider the matter we have never treated athletics as a vital part of our national physical training we are always intent upon the show games 
we forget that it is infinitely more important that boys should enjoy themselves in some healthy way really suited to their natures than that they should become adepts in cricket or football cricket and similar games do i suppose train character and there is a legend that they train boys in unselfishness although i have not particularly remarked that school athletes are of a sweet unselfish retiring disposition but i must say that i do not consider cricket an ideal way of spending the afternoon even for the proficient cricketers it is played in the open air but it is not part of the outdoor life as i understand it what do you mean by the outdoor life i suppose i am thinking of my favourite pupils who spend the afternoon with me exploring old quarries in the search of fossils or grubbing in ditches for rare plants or tracking birds and beasts with infinite stealth to their lairs not to destroy but to observe i look at them tired healthy happy and voracious returning from a long tramp would that afternoon have been better spent even in the most brilliant cricket the fact is it's so much less trouble to make all boys play one game and stick to one occupation i rather think it's a neglect of duty on the part of their teachers you are right as far as you go hoffman i think it is clear that we must have more variety in our games and occupations even pure athletics such as running and swimming are rather neglected there are a thousand other games little played in schools yet not contemptible and not unsuitable for boys fives golf tennis lacrosse what boy even learns to punt or is seriously taught to drive a motor edwinson will doubtlessly tell us that football and especially cricket are very beautiful picturesque games very traditional and fine but we are concerned with english physique which is more important than english cricket and to improve this physique we must subject our weak or ill-formed boys to special training men who play cricket well may be round-shouldered men who row well may overdevelop themselves on one side and according to a well substantiated legend if they row too well they die young gymnasts tend to assimilate to the eugene sandow type to become of dwarfed and monstrous appearance with exaggerated muscles standing out in knobs all over their bodies rather then my dear edwinson we will revert to maiden annan of your beloved greeks we will be mindful of the types of polycletus to do this we must give a special not a general gymnastic training we must take our athletics more seriously and spend more trouble over them we will not permit boys to stand in platoons and swing bars up and down we will not be delighted to watch them promiscuously scrambling over the horse and up the ladder we will not let them grow into short and hideous gymnasts but we will with the aid of medical wisdom and specialized gymnastics cure round shoulders narrow chests and spindle arms and i think we shall be rewarded for our pains would you not teach them also something about the laws of health and the structure of the human body the older boys and those who are going to be doctors or artists may learn all they like how to bandage a wound how to save life what to take for a cold everyone should know but we must be very careful or we may give them that little knowledge which is so dangerous they will either not say when they are ill and try to cure themselves or whenever they have a pain in the back they will come trembling to us and announce that they have bright's disease then about hours of work holidays and so forth are you contented with the present day system i think it is an important question there seems little to suggest there should be far less preparation of work in evenings far more direct plunging into a new subject in class there should never be any work before breakfast at all but boys might get up earlier than they usually do at about six thirty in summer bathe and have breakfast at once while in winter they need not rise till about eight o'clock the youngest boys however ought not to get up as early as suggested in summer or the day will be too long there should be two half holidays a week in the winter terms with a short and interesting hour's work in the late afternoon but three half holidays a week in summer and every opportunity should be given to boys for spending their sundays in excursions over the countryside for the attendant evils of these excursions the irate farmer whose horse has been ridden round a field the boy with the catapult the boy who goes into a public house to be grand and drinks a mug of beer 
and the boy who surreptitiously buys black dog cigarettes are not very terrible after all and the attendant advantages are too great to be missed we shall not i hope maintain discipline with the rod we shall hoffman there is i admit a certain peril of the flagellant vices but we must run so inconsiderable a risk for the sake of considerable advantages at any rate we shall not lend ourselves to the vulgar opinion of those sentimentalists who consider it degrading to endure physical pain and laying a practically obscene stress on the torments of physical discomfort pathetically invite us to use moral suasion punishment is absolutely necessary in a large school it must be proportionable to the offence and the only two possible punishments that are so proportionable are detention and caning in the hours of detention we should insist that a boy be occupied in some form of hard but profitable work malicious penalties such as the assignment of lines we should esteem beneath us boys would usually themselves prefer to be dealt with quickly and summarily and it is very possible we shall give them the choice of treatment when we can most headmasters nowadays are extremely careful not to touch particularly delicate and nervous boys and the days when floggings in school were a real and serious evil ceased with the death of that headmaster often called great who made his school famous as the place where they flogged the boys so when we punish boys we shall i fear have to lecture them a little they must be aware of our displeasure particularly if the offence is of a mean or underhand kind they must be clearly shown that they have done the sort of thing the best boys do not do on the other hand if they are caught smoking or arraigned for juvenile clamour we will not weep over the enormity of the offence but deal with it succinctly i may be wrong in this to tell you the truth i consider the sentimentalist more poisonous than the flagellant uh, we have perhaps left the most difficult problem untouched oh the sex problem there is no difficulty about that or if there is it lies in the sentimental obtuseness of the public wells has settled the matter for ever by suggesting a book on the subject and such a book every boy in the school shall possess it must contain the exact truth without exaggerating the dangers or threatening hell it must clearly state that the popular prejudices are against certain things without agreeing or disagreeing with those prejudices it will clearly add that for the school's sake any immorality discovered will be severely and corporally punished we can avoid in our open-air system as well as in any other those pernicious partition dormitories which so obviously foster vice we shall not expel boys and we shall not like the conventional headmaster pretend to faint with horror when we discover others acting as we might perhaps with a little temptation have acted ourselves had we ever been members of so monastic an establishment as a public school the chapel is perhaps a help emotional purity in the young is to my mind an insidious form of indecency it is laying too much stress on things the normal boy troubles as little about the matter as possible and he is perfectly and entirely right so saying smith seemed to think he had exhausted the question for he changed the subject a little abruptly and began to criticise the poetry of Browning. End of chapter three. End of part twelve.